The message today is entitled Backward. I don't think it's a self-commentary, although you might think that I am a little backward, but I don't think so. I think sometimes I'm probably as much as mainstream as anybody. But I wanted to give you an idea about living the Christian life. As you recall, last Sunday, um, I delivered a message called Unique, with the emphasis on Y-O-U. And today, I want to talk about living life by looking backward in our life and seeing if it has any maybe predictable effect in terms of looking back on the things that we had a passion for and have a passion for, and is it maybe a predictor of things that we can do in the future. And so for the text of today's lesson, I've used Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. And he's saying, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. I think every so often, all of us in our lives find ourselves just kind of riding the flow of life. You know, it's like we're not resisting anything, we're not thrashing about, we're just kind of riding on this crest of life. Uh, you know, it's like a stronger current lifts us and channels and carries us to a place daring us to declare, I was made to do this. Have you ever been in that flow? Have you ever found yourself in that sweet spot of life saying, man, this is what I was made to do? And I think the answer to that question is probably you've had that experience. Because I want you to go back to your youth, like the picture overhead. What activity in your young life lured you off the gray sidewalk of your experiences and sameness into this amusement park of sights and sounds and colors? What were you doing? Maybe you were assembling a model airplane in the garage. Maybe you were helping your aunt plant seeds, maybe out in the garden. Maybe you were organizing games for some playground activity. Uh, to this day, you probably remember the details of those days. If, for instance, it was assembling model airplanes, you, know, you can smell still that glue that you used. Maybe if it's planting seeds with your aunt, you still feel that sense of the soil, the dampness, the dankness, but the richness of the soil into which you're planting the seeds. And, you know, if you were organizing Backyard games or playground games, you can remember the excited squeals of the friends with whom you were playing whatever the game was, whether it was football or soccer or baseball. You can look back on that time in your childhood and think, man, that was just really a magical moment for me. And the only bad moment in that particular childhood memory was the final moment. I remember during the summertime, at least in my era, my parents would just say, have fun, just be home before the street lights come on. There was really no other condition given to me. I, there was a high school nearby, there was a huge open field where I grew up that was nearby. And we'd do all sorts of fun stuff during the summertime. And the only requirement was just be home before the lights came on the street. And now, fast forward just a few years in your life. Let childhood now become adolescence. Let it become elementary school. Let it become middle school. Let it become high school. And again, I want you as you're sitting there now to reflect on some of those memories about that experience in your life. Those full flight moments of unclocked time and complete unlocked energy. All cylinders are clicking in your life. And again, what were you doing? What energized you? during that period of time? What engaged you? Now, fast forward a little bit further. I want you to analyze your best days as an adult. No upstream flailing like we were talking about, just riding that current, 
no battling against the tide. During the times you rode that very tide, what activities carried you? What objects were you holding? What topics were you considering? And when you start thinking about that, I want you to analyze and find out if there are any common themes, common themes from childhood to adolescence to high school to young adulthood to adulthood. Do you see any common threads that go through your life? To be sure, Obviously, as we get older, the scenery changes and the characters drop out of the picture from time to time. And the details may alter, but your bent, your passion, what you really yearn to do, you keep doing. And honestly, why not? Because it comes easily to you. Not necessarily without a struggle, but it certainly comes more easily to you than it does to your peers. So I was thinking about this this week as I was preparing the lesson and suggesting that if we want direction for our future, then maybe sometimes we should read our life backward. Job placement consultants at People Management International, Inc. have asked over 70,000 clients this question. What things have you done in life that you enjoyed doing and believe you did well? In every case, writes the founder, Arthur Miller Jr., the data showed that people had invariably reverted to the same pattern of functioning whenever they had done something they enjoyed doing and did well. Or to put it succinctly, our past presents our future. And perhaps some of you are saying now, come on, wait. Can that really be true? Can my past really suggest and present my future? Can childhood interests forecast my adult abilities and passions? Can early leanings serve as maybe first sketches of the final portrait? Well, if you use Old Testament characters, it certainly suggests that that's the case. And I want to start first with an Egyptian prince. As a young man, he excelled in the ways of the court. He mastered the laws of the ancient land. He studied at the feet of the world's finest astronomers and mathematicians and lawyers. 1,500 years later, he was remembered as, quote, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty in words and deeds. That's what Luke says for us in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. Learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty in words and deeds. What little we actually know about Moses' upbringing tells us two things. First, he displayed an extraordinary affinity for higher learning, and he also demonstrated an allergy to injustice. Because do you remember his first adult appearance in Scripture? He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and killed the Egyptian. That's the first thing we know about Moses in his adult life. The next day, Moses sees two Hebrews beating up on each other, and he attempts to intervene and split up the fight. And then one of the Hebrews says, Heh, who made you a prince and a judge over us? And I want you to camp out for just a minute on the ideas a prince and a judge. These are two Hebrew slaves who were engaged in physical contact, and Moses has separated them. And now they are looking at this individual saying, who made you both prince and judge of us? How accurate was that description? Well, to find out, you need to go to the next chapter of Moses' life. Because to avoid arrest for killing the Egyptian, 
Moses had to scamper into the Badlands, and he was encountered by even more injustice there. Exodus chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 tells us the following. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. The question is, what do you think drove Moses to protect these young women? Was it their beauty? Was it to get a drink? It could have been perhaps both, but it may also have been something else. Because did you notice what Moses did in just these two verses? It's the irrepressible seeds of fairness that Moses had early in life that then demonstrate themselves out in the Midian wilderness. When he decked a cruel Egyptian, when he was a ruler over Egypt, and now he is scattering chauvinistic shepherds. And the question it raises in my mind is, was he acting out his God-given bent toward justice? The rest of his life, if you analyze it, would say exactly so. Forty years after he fled Egypt, Moses returns, this time with God's burning bush encouragement, blessing, and power. He dismantles Pharaoh's entire kingdom and unshackles the Hebrew slave. You see, church, Moses, the prince, escorted his people into a new kingdom. And Moses, the judge, framed the Torah and literally midwifed the entirety of Hebrew law. The strengths of Moses' youth unveiled the passions of Moses' life. But I want you to consider another example. I want you to fast forward in your mind nearly two millennia and consider yet another case, this time in the New Testament. Like Moses, this young scholar had displayed a youthful love of the law. He studied at the feet of Jerusalem's finest teachers. He followed the Torah with razor-sharp precision. He aligned himself with the Pharisees, who, as you know, were ardent observers of Scripture. The Pharisees defended the Scripture with zeal. And zeal is the term that he used to describe his youth. Here's what he says. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Zealous, he wrote. Yes, in fact, I harshly persecuted the church. Young Saul's ardor prompted his initial appearance in Scripture. And just like Moses, it's a murder that brings him on stage. Angry members of the Jewish council, as we read in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, had cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, you can call Saul misguided. You can call Saul misled. You can even call him mistaken. But you can never call Saul mild. He was not a mild-mannered person. If you scratched him, he bled commitment. He may have been misguided in his early life and his commitment, but he was committed nonetheless. And whether he was Saul the legalist or later Paul, the apostle of grace. He couldn't sit still. He was cause-driven. He was single-minded. He was focused like a hawk on its prey. Peter might tolerate the hypocrisy of the church, but not Paul. (laughs) With Paul, you're either in or you're out. You're either hot or you're cold. 
whether persecuting disciples or making them, Paul impacted people. And it was an early strength in his life that forecast his long life trait. One more example. Best photo I could find. The boy's name is Billy Frank. And I want you to consider the younger days of this young Billy Frank. He happened to be the elder son of a dairy farm. And his dad would roust him out of bed at about 2.30 in the morning to do chores around the farm. Now, he has a younger brother. His name is Melvin. And Melvin relished that work. He would tag along long before he was really able to help on the farm to live and work by his dad's side. He was eager to take his turn long before he was able, but not Billy Frank. I mean, he and Melvin had the same father, but not the same passion. The minute he finished his chores, Billy Frank would dash into the hayloft, and no sooner would he get to the hayloft than he would open up his copy of maybe Tarzan or Marco Polo. By the age of 14, Billy Frank had literally read and traced the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Missionary stories and accounts of brave servants in faraway lands fascinated this boy most of all. Later, as a college student at Florida Bible Institute, he visited with every evangelist who would give him time. He served their tables, he polished their shoes, he caddied for those who played golf, he carried their luggage, he posed to have pictures taken with them, and he wrote home to tell his mother how much he, quote, longed to be like this one or that one. Billy Frank bore one more trademark, energy. His mother remembered, there was never any quietness about Billy. I was relieved when he started school. He was always hyperactive before the term existed. Always running, always inquiring, always questioning. He just never wears down. At least that's what his parents told the doctor. And the doctor said, well, it's just the way Billy is built. It was very reassuring that this hyperactivity was just Billy's nature. So now I want you to study Billy's mosaic. Fascinated with books and words, intrigued by missionaries and faraway lands, and blessed with boundless energy. What happens with a boy like that? And what happens when God's Spirit convinces him of sin and salvation? Young Billy Frank decided to drop his middle name and go by just his first and last name. After all, an evangelist needs to be taken seriously. And people took Billy Frank Graham very seriously. Now, church, what if Graham had ignored his heart? What if his parents had forced him to stay on the farm? What if no one had noticed God's pattern in his life? And what if you fail to notice the pattern of your own? Remember, God planned and packed you on purpose for his purpose. Paul, in writing to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 10 says, It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. You, church, are heaven's custom design. God determined your every detail. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Who made a person's mouth? And who makes someone deaf? Or who gives a person sight or blindness? It is I, the Lord. And since you are God's idea, then you're a good idea. What God said about Jeremiah, he also says to you. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 says, 
Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. You see, God shaped you according to your special work. Because how else can you explain yourself? I mean, how can you explain maybe your ability to diagnose a problem with the engine just by hearing something in the engine itself that doesn't sound quite right? I mean, how can you bake this extraordinary cake without even having to use a recipe? How about you knowing Civil War history better than your own history teacher? I mean, how do you explain those talents? How do you explain that bent? How do you explain that passion? It's because that's what God put in you. How do you explain those quirks of skill? Well, going back to what we were talking about earlier, God knew that young Israel, leaving Egypt and its captivity, would need a code, a rule, a law. So he gave Moses a love for the law. God also knew that the doctrine of grace would need a very fiery advocate because up until New Testament Christianity, grace was not even in the lexicon. It was the Old Testament that controlled. And so now this new covenant that Jesus was going to give his life for was going to start something new, this word called grace. And it was going to be put into a society that did not know what grace meant. So how are you going to convey this new offer, this grace, to a community and to a civilization that never knew the term, much less its explanation and application? Well, you'd have to put it in the hands of somebody who could forcefully, articulately explain what grace is. And God chose Paul to do that. And in your own individual case, he knew what your generation would need, and he gave it. He designed you. And his design defines your destiny. I want you to think back about Peter's admonition in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. So what have you always done well? And what have you always loved to do? And that last question trips up a lot of, I think, well-meaning folks because we all respond, well, God wouldn't let me do what I like to do, would he? I mean, isn't God the one with the taskmaster and the whip and the chains and he wants to keep me unhappy? He wants to make sure I know my position in life. Why would God ever allow me to do something I really like to do? According to Paul, he would. Here's what he says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. God is working in you to help you want to do and be... That bears repeating. Listen. God is working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases Him. Your designer couples the want to with the be able to do. It's like desire shares the driver's seat with ability. David, in writing Psalm, verse 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, I believe that your heavenly Father is far too gracious to assign you to a life of misery. And I would encourage you, as I do with me, 
to see our desires as gifts rather than longings that need to be suppressed. And I want you this week to go ahead and reflect on your life. What have you always done well and loved to do? Some may find that question just a little too simple. I mean, don't we need to be measuring something? Don't we need to be measuring aptitude or temperament? Don't we need to consult the tea leaves or the teachers? Don't we need to read some manuals and horoscopes? I mean, we inventory spiritual gifts like we inventory our ancestors. Don't we need to measure this against something? While some of these strategies might be an aid to some, a simpler answer, I believe, lies before us or perhaps better stated, lies within us. Read your life backward and check your supplies and re-relish your moments of success and satisfaction because I believe that the scripture supports the proposition that it is in the merger of these two, the success with the satisfaction that you will find your uniqueness. I spent the past couple of Sundays really trying to demonstrate for you, as I believe Scripture supports, that God created every one of you with a talent, an ability, and a passion. And I don't want you coming into the church doors and checking that talent and that passion and ambition, and simply come in here and be a pew potato and just say, well, this is how I play church. That's not healthy. That's not a family. I think when you go to family reunions, you are who you are, right? We all know the habits of some of the family members that we get together with maybe during Thanksgiving. You know, you don't want to ask Uncle Howard to say the prayer because we'll never get to dinner. He'll just go on and on and on. But Uncle Howard didn't check his personality at the door simply because he's going to a Thanksgiving dinner. Uncle Howard is Uncle Howard. And so many times, I think as Christians, we have this tendency to look at somebody else, maybe even within our own group, say, man, I wish I had that person's faith. Man, I wish I had that woman's prayer life. Oh boy, if I just had that talent, who knows what I could do? But when you do that, you're not camping out on what you were uniquely created to do. And who's to say that I might not look at you and just say, wow, I wish I had that passion. Wow, I wish I had that zeal. Wow, I wish I had those experiences. All of us need to strive to be the person that God created us to be. He didn't create me to be you, and he didn't create you to be somebody else. He created you for a purpose, and gave you the passions, and the successes, and the desire to not only do what pleases God, but couple it with the talents that he's given you to do what pleases God. So church, this week, I just want you to kind of camp out in God's word this week, and really thank him for making you the unique person you ought to be to spend less time of your life comparing yourselves to others and to statistics, and spend more time really understanding and embracing the you that God created you to be. I mean, I can't can't do half the things that so many of you in this church can, because my day profession is I'm an attorney, I can talk, which is what I do. So that's my talent. That's just something I do every day. So I can come here and I can share with you on a Sunday morning because that's what I do Monday through Friday. And to ask some of you to stand up in front of a crowd, you'd be absolutely mollified. But I couldn't fly a helicopter. (laughs) I couldn't navigate a ship. I couldn't bake a cake without a recipe. And even then, it's probably going to be a little iffy. So I can't be you any more than you can be me. 
but we can all be who God created us to be, and that's what a family is. We can't all be hands, we can't all be legs, we can't all be eyes and ears and heads. It would be a very deformed body. But when you put the arms together with the legs together, with the eyes together, with the ears together, with the mind together, with God in control, it creates a family that can live in harmony with one another and accentuate each other's weaknesses because where I have a strength, you may not. And where I have a weakness, you may have a strength. And together as a family, we build one another up in our faith. So this week, church, just think about you. It's okay. I don't think that's being selfish. I don't think it's being conceited. I think the scripture actually encourages us, because I shared that with you last week, about inventorying your talents and your skills. Find out who you are. Because only in the finding out of who you are can God then work with you to make you the person that he created you to be. I'll use one last example, and I've used it several times. But again, I think it just talks a little bit about what God does. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And the example that I've shared with you before is Michelangelo. Michelangelo was this brilliant sculptor, as you know. The David, we all know about that. But he sculpted thousands of other things. He was a brilliant individual and an amazing intellect. And one day, somebody was asking him, well, how, how do you take a slab of rock and create the David, let's say? Michelangelo's response was very simple. I see the image within the rock, and I carve away the material that prevents us from seeing the image. And God has done the same with us. He created you with an image in mind that is unique among this planet. And as we grow and as we age and as we mature and as we grow deep in our faith, it is this chipping away of the stuff that prevents that image that God's created us to be that can then be reflected in the community in which we live. It's a process, granted. You don't wake up one day being a completely different person. It takes time. But to the extent that we can start working on who this image is and then chipping away the stuff that prevents us from being the child of God that he wants us to be, I think that's a very healthy exercise and one that God encourages. And I would encourage you to do the same this week. So we need to trust in God. And we need to obey God. And that's the song that we're going to be singing here in just a minute. Trust and obey. For there is no other way, what? To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and to obey. Let's stand.